afternoon everyone joining us uh we're just waiting for a few more to uh join from the uh lobby and then i will um uh, begin OK, um, we have um, 82 people uh, joining us so far, so uh, thank you to everyone who's joined. Um, Brendan, I'll let you uh, carry on uh, admitting anyone um, else and we will um, begin. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this Society of Light and Lighting uh, Home Counties Northwest event. Uh, today's webinar is on the subject of external lighting and social quality, uh, posing the question uh, of the right to the right light. Uh, so my name is Chris Dix, uh, I'm at CBG Consultants in Oxford and I'm also the Regional Chair for the SLL, so I'll be the um, Chair for this afternoon. Uh, we're hosting an event this afternoon on uh, MS Teams, which is a first for our region, um, so please bear with us if we have any uh, technical issues. Uh, if you do find that you lose the sound or the video uh, during the talk, uh, please just try disconnecting and rejoining. Uh, the chat box will remain active for the uh, duration. Uh, do feel free to post questions and comments as we go along. Uh, I'll put a selection of these to our speakers during the Q&A at the end, um, but we probably won't be responding to them during the actual talk, uh, but, but do feel free to uh, post things as you think of them. Um, and a recording of the event will be available on the SLL's website afterwards. Um, Don and Electra have also kindly agreed to uh, allow their slides to be circulated following the event too. Uh, so I'm now delighted to uh, introduce uh, Electra Bordenaro of Light Follows Behaviour and Don Slater from the London School of Economic Sociology uh, Department. Uh, both of them are part of LSE's Configuring Light Research Group. So they'll be speaking to you today about how as a society we uh, approach urban lighting and how that differs from areas uh, depending on wealth and uh, inequality and whether as an industry we're uh, approaching external lighting in the right way. Uh, so thank you again for joining us both of you and, and I will hand you over to Don and Electra now. Thanks very much. Um, the slides are shared, everyone can see and hear, yes? Yes, OK. Yes, I um, can. <laughs> great. I needed feedback. Um, we're really delighted to be here um, and to be talking to SLL um, about a topic that's obviously very dear to our hearts. Um, configuring Light is a um, collaboration between Electra and I and another sociologist, Joe Entwistle. Um, and um, we're fairly unique in being a collaboration between sociology and lighting design. Um, so we are concerned with understanding how light impacts people, um, how it can be used to support the kinds of urban life that people would like to lead, um, and to find ways in which sociologists and lighting designers can work together so that um, on the one hand, lighting designers have a better understanding of the social worlds that they're working in. Um, and sociologists get a better understanding of how um, cities and city spaces work. So it's been a, a very, very fruitful um, collaboration for about 14 years now, I think. Um, the um, concern of ours with inequality is pretty central to both sociology and indeed to lighting um, and any kind of urban design. That's to say we're concerned about how the material of the city, things like light um, and streets, allow people to exercise their right to the city. That's to say their right to um, participate fully in public life in the city um, and how lighting can support or hinder um, their, um, their life in, in the city world. Um, just to summarize, uh, do have a look at our website. We've now done an, quite a range of activities 
We do academic research, we do consultancy, we do public engagement like this, and we work on policy. And again, the idea is to understand how light is shaped, how it's put to work um, in cities, and to understand how social research and lighting design can work together. We work internationally um, and we work on quite a range of largely public realm projects. We'll talk about a couple of cases um, in a moment. How does lighting and inequality, um, how, how can you connect them? It's not the most obvious question. Um, people generally, um, both within the lighting professions and outside, think about lighting very much either in purely technical terms or largely technical terms, um, how to um, meet certain kinds of legal and policy requirements um, at the least possible cost. Um, in which case, it's about providing an infrastructure shared by everyone. So where does inequality enter into that? Um, on the other hand, lighting is bound up in very aesthetic effects. Um, that's to say, to create a kind of um, lighting atmosphere, again, where do, which is shared by everyone. Where does inequality fit into that? It's not always obvious, and yet, uh, and yet it is. Um, it's something that we experience all the time. Um, in this slide, we simply put together some of the ways in which we um, can think about lighting and inequality together. Um, we certainly think about access. In, to what extent does lighting make it easier or more difficult for different kinds of people? Disabled, neurodiverse, older people, younger people, people with children, people with pets, and so on. Um, in what ways does lighting help or hinder access, our ability to actually enjoy public space um, through things like wayfinding, through the ways in which it makes spaces navigable. There are incredible inequalities bound up, um, which we'll talk about in a moment, particularly in terms of elder, elderly people. Um, different kinds of lighting provide different form, different levels of comfort um, and allow people to feel more or less safe um, in space consider gender differences, ethnic differences, class and age differences. Um, lighting actually, to use our sociological phrase, codes spaces in different ways. It gives spaces different amount of value um, through the kind of lighting attention that is given, um, which says something about the different and unequal value of different sorts of people um, in the city. Um, and I'd also say there's been um, a kind of uneasy relation to the idea of inequality, which has been um, growing recently through the idea of, for example, human centric lighting or lighting for people, um, where there's a kind of myth of um, lighting for all people as if people weren't very, very different with very, very different kinds of needs. How do we actually um, use lighting in relation to real differences between people um, so that actually um, works against inequality rather than simply making inequalities invisible or untalked about. Um, crucial to all of those questions is the issue of diversity, of understanding the differences between people. Um, inequality is not just about more or less power or resources or whatever. It's actually about the kinds of differences you find in the city and the extent to which those differences are acknowledged and addressed by things like lighting and the design of our public spaces. So before we can actually address inequality, we actually have to look at what inequalities are composed of, what they're made of, which is social difference and the way in which those differences are addressed. Um, so we certainly confront when in any kind of lighting design um, project or research for lighting design, we're looking at a whole range of people with different needs, um, different issues of access, different things they actually want to do in public space. Um, we have to manage the coexistence, people sharing spaces, which they don't necessarily want to use um, in ways, in similar ways, and in fact, are obviously a lot of conflict. Um, we have to deal with the ways in which 
different parts of the city are, again, coded um, to appear to be for certain kinds of people and not other kinds of people. And we have to manage the relationship between a whole range of different stakeholders, particularly public and private ones. Um, just to illustrate again the, some of the points already, um, this is just a street in actually a place we did research called Darby, um, which was lit apparently for um, equal access to people. In fact, <clears throat> it um, was really threatening, unpleasant, and most people didn't use the street um, because the lighting didn't actually take account of the different kinds of things that people wanted to do. It was lit purely for, for the, the technical and cost um, elements um, versus what I described before as aesthetic lighting. Um, where the lighting was it was lit really for heritage, for commerce, for tourism, um, for a very different kind of for for investment as well. This was actually a still from a, a, a marketing brochure for Derby. Um, these are very, very different ways of addressing a population through light um, and deal with inequalities and different the relationship between people in very different ways. Again, an example of coding um, in which lighting, which we often take for granted, actually is all about inequality. On the left hand side, you see a council of actually Peabody housing, social housing estate with um, bulkhead lighting of the cheapest sort, the, as bright as can be, um, literally lighting for the expectation of public disorder and placing the lightest possible lights outside people's front doors as if they were um, passageways to be policed rather than places where people lived, as opposed to a gaslit street in Westminster just around the corner from the Houses of Parliament, which is clearly lit for heritage um, with the expectation of a cozy, comfortable, rich atmosphere. It's hard to... Um, make the um, these kinds of contrasts apparent to people until you put the photographs next to each other, because otherwise we tend to take these differences and inequalities for granted. We also have to take them for granted because a lot of these inequalities are absolutely built in, not just to what we look at, but the whole systems of how lighting is provided. The bulkhead lighting that we're talking about, which is unchanged since the 1960s or 1970s, um, is not just, it, you know, kind of taken for granted way associated with social housing, mass housing, post-war modernism and so on. Um, but this is actually um, a advert from a sales brochure where that lighting is actually called social housing fixtures. <clears throat> That's to say, it's it, you would not find this lighting in a middle class residential district, in a commercial downtown district, in heritage lighting. Of course you wouldn't. But it's that of course, which is very important. How do we code these inequalities um, into the very fabric of our streets and neighborhoods? I said before that it's absolutely crucial. Um, I mean, changing lighting so that it addresses um, inequalities and actually meets the needs of, of diverse people. It's not just a matter of changing light bulbs. It's also, and this is me as a sociologist speaking, it's about understanding this incredible degree of social complexity that exists in any space that you light. Um, we divide this up um, into four features um, where we, of the kind of that social complexity, which we feel that people need to understand before they actually know how light engages with a particular city street or city park or whatever. Um, how much do you have to understand? Diversity, I've already talked about. Who are the different kinds of um, people who make up this space um, between the older people, younger people, teenagers, women with children? fathers with children, dog walkers, et cetera, et cetera. Practices, which is simply a sociological term for what are people trying to do in this space? 
what are the different kinds of things and often conflicting things that people are trying to do in this space. Older people who want to be in the brightest possible area and teenagers who want to be in, in the shadows <coughs> are doing that because they are trying to do different things and relate to that place differently. What kind of place is this? What kind of atmosphere does it have? What kinds of identity? And again, what identity does this place have for different kinds of people? It's not the same place um, for everyone. It's different. Um, and connections. How does the place that you are lighting connect outwards, for example, to the rest of the, of the city? Is it, a, again, like a council, a social housing estate, um, a kind of recognized through its lighting as a kind of um, separated out dangerous danger spot in relation to the rest of the city? Or is it integrated through lighting? with the rest of the life around it and the other neighborhoods that are adjacent to it. So all of these things are what go into trying to understand the complexity that we're actually, the social complexity that we're actually lighting. Okay, we want to just give two examples um, of the kind of, um, you know, concrete situations in which we have to deal with all, all of this and what inequality means in these different contexts. The first one I'm going to do fairly quickly. Um, Electra and I um, in configuring light are involved in a European, we're still European, a European project um, <laughs> under Horizon 2020. It's huge and it's called Enlighten Me. They all have to have puns for their titles. <laughs> um, and it's basically a project um, looking at, as this very poetic title says, Innovative policies for improving citizens' health and well-being, addressing indoor and outdoor lighting. What it actually amounts to is a project on the relationship between light, health, and elderly populations in Europe. Um, and we are involved in lighting, um, in research and lighting in three cities, Bologna in Italy, Amsterdam, um, or a district of Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and the place no one knows about, which is Tartu in Estonia. Um, and we are doing, or we've been doing a full year's worth of research on what it means to be old in all those three cities um, and how lighting might help to address issues of being elderly in ways and in, in, in different stages of being elderly, different conditions of being elderly. Now, one reason for talking about and to develop evidence-based understandings and guidelines for using lighting to enhance the health and well-being of urban older people. Now, the reason this fits in a talk about inequality um, is because it's a really common approach within policy, within everyday language, within people's awareness to simply talk about, oh, we're lighting the elderly as if the elderly were one group of people, I can tell you as one, I'm not, um, <clears throat> that the elderly are <clears throat> um, just one group and to address inequality would simply be to kind of bump up the lighting um, for older people on these streets. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. And it's wonderful to be doing a comparative study of three cities where we can actually talk about that. Um, just to um, go back one step, yeah, we're doing years of, of research with older populations in all three cities, and we are doing um, one-year lighting installations, which we can talk about in questions if you would like, in particular sites in all those areas. So we can actually experiment with and co-design with people to get a sense of how various changes in lighting parameters, particularly tunable white and dimming, um, might change the feel of that space and different people's use of that space. What we're finding, though, in relation to inequality is that um, being old is incredibly different in all those places. So that one policy for aging and one policy for lighting the aging um, would be simply ridiculous, in fact. Um, and we actually require much closer attention to what we call the social organization of aging. How is aging done? How is it performed in these different cities? And even within those cities, for example, in Amsterdam, we have 
four or five different major ethnic groups, all of whom have different experiences of public space, of being in the Netherlands, um, different family structures and so on, which change the way in which being old um, is carried out. So how, is aging, how does aging work in these places um, is a massive question before we even get on to the lighting. Within that project, we've, um, in order to compare these three cities, we talk about a whole range of things. Being active, we all talk about active aging, it's very different in all three places. In Bologna, it basically means going onto the square to meet your friends. In Tartu, it means going out on your own to do very active um, activities, but largely on your own, antisocial. In Amsterdam, it means actually getting together in very active um, aging groups, which are social groups and often very formal. Now, if you're lighting public spaces for active aging, it's going to be quite different in all of those places. And the same thing can be said going through the rest of these um, themes that we follow. To look at the inequalities, the differences in aging, the diversity of aging, we have to look at how people of di in different places um, relate to public space. What are their social connections? Who do they meet in public space? Who do they gather with? What is gathering on about? How are people valued in those spaces? And so on and so forth. Again, we could go on. <clears throat> Again, what we're foregrounding here, and I'll turn over to Letcher for the, the second example, what we're talking about is just how complex it is to understand inequality and diversity, and then on top of that, to respond to that through lighting and lighting design. Letra, do you want me to, I'll keep chit flicking the slides, you tell me when to, yeah. Thanks, Don, and thanks everyone for being here. Yes, just one thing to add to, to Don's presentation on regarding Bologna, Tartu and uh, Amsterdam is that actually we are uh, in a position now, I mean, we have designed the three case studies uh, in terms of lighting and um, one of the main partner um, is uh, providing all the fixtures. So, I mean, we had freedom to make it different but not so much. What I think is quite interesting that um, it's a, it's really a trial uh, in urban lighting is that we have a full fully tunable white LED engine and with different um, color rendering, different zoning. So, I mean, the, the idea is really to create different scenario for a year and to get feedback from the population, for the elderly, uh, depending on, you know, the, the the different settings. So we have one year to, to play and this year is has to come. So we are very excited about that. Um, the second example we want to bring in is uh, is Brandon Estate. Uh, and probably some of you, you know, they know it is um, in Southwark. So we work closely with Southwark Council, and we have been called by Southwark because uh, in, on Brandon Estate has really a bad reputation, particularly on newspaper. Um, and uh, when uh, we we were called in uh, one year before, just one year before, um, a stabbing happened of um, a very young guy. And I think that's what's why uh, Brandon was included in this program that was called Great Estate Improvements by Southern Council, that it was um, a bottom up kind of experience where the residents were deciding which were the things to improve. And uh, in Brandon Tree, that is one part of Brandon Estate, was actually the lightings coming as a priority. Uh, in reality, the area where we work on was really tiny. It's uh, this triangular shape square. Uh, the door was lit um, was lit with, uh, as usual, I mean, like a massive bulkhead uh, with very, very high contrast uh, and uh, and very disuniform dis dis lighting. And the problem was that this little square in reality was uh, a place where in theory to rest, uh, a place where to socialize in theory, because as you can see, there's no sitting, nothing, uh, and also a place to connect from the shopping street to the all the housing. Problem is that you had to cross that square and you had to cross the garden where the stabbing happened. So 
again, here we work closely. Uh, it was COVID period, so it was very difficult. We have to engage, to start engaging online for the first time. And you understand that that's already quite unequal because, I mean, a lot of people don't have access to technology in that sense. Uh, but And that's why I think we kind of also reversed a bit the program in a sense that we engage a bit online. And then when we had an idea, we implement the idea. And then we do a lot of engagement after. Uh, yeah, the main issues were uh, that basically, I mean, of course, as all in social housing, you know, like uh, the 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 feed. I mean, the feedback we got is that, of course, the lighting was like more prison yard lighting, um, and as well, I mean, like uh, the. There, it was more of a, like a, as usual. I mean, on social housing, people think that is more political performance. In fact, the funny the funny anecdote on this story is that um, when we start interviewing people, uh, all the all the people living across the area, they were saying, "Oh, we couldn't see anyone. We couldn't see anything of that event. Uh, we just heard a lot of screaming and and it was like, was it dark when uh, when it happened? It's like, yeah, yeah, it was." night it was like a full night and then i mean looking at the the criminal records we discovered it was like 6 p.m in july uh so it was basically impossible to start particularly in london um but as reaction the council uh without checking possibly they just changed all the lighting on the side um and they changed the lighting with the tree i mean like you will see a video after i think we will be able to share it but if not we just leave you the link uh you will see there's like this massive led super glary super bright lighting so the point was as brighter as possible and we get a lot of time this answer as bright as possible particularly for the elderly and that's why i mean also in brandon there was a lot of elderly living across the state and i think it's <coughs> it's really important that we kind of tackle the issue of why and I mean, when you get an answer like that, as bright as possible, particularly for the elderly that may have, you know, problem in vision, pair visual um, uh, vision. I mean, like you, you need really to understand which is the problem. And the problem was, for example, that we discover later a lot of people couldn't see because of the of the landscape because the bushes were really tall uh, so it was not just the lighting it was actually uh, the, the problem of the the problem of the landscape as well um, and again like uh, it's very important yeah you you see here how the space was lit as usual you had you know like on the side uh, a very very bright path but in the center of the square where actually the people were supposed to gather uh, it was like actually pretty dark and completely disuniform as well you couldn't perceive the square at all from you know from coming from one side or the other of the of the estate uh, and i mean we we had the um with the council we agreed to do a pilot for a six months period uh, where we actually put in place something quite easy in a sense because uh, that's what we had to do we had a very small budget and a pilot for six months so we couldn't do any infrastructure work uh, so we started zigzagging uh, a catenary a catenary festive lighting across the trees and we use the trees as you know like kind of structure uh, and as well we add some uh, spotlight um, onto the trees to light up the path uh, and uh, of course, it seems like a very normal festive lighting, but we took care a lot of time. We took care to decide really which bulb uh, was important to use, the color temperature, not to be glary, not to be too too bright, but even not to be too uh, too dim, uh, because. I mean, they were coming from a situation where the, the sides were really bright and we, we didn't want to create this kind of contrast immediately. So we say to the council, let's start with a, you know, a good level and then we dim down later. I mean, people will adapt, but they can't adapt immediately uh, to something so different. Um, the other, and I think that went down very well and you will see in the film, I mean, was very successful and people start gather gathering around uh, they, they organized christmas carol and events under uh, as soon as the, it was possible to go out again uh, the funny thing is that um, as um, as we usually do with uh, with don and joe i mean when you start interviewing people there's a there's a lot of funny things that are coming out and there's not just about lighting so we discovered for example that sitting was utterly important for the elderly to stop by and to get kind of a way a place to rest 
So as soon as we heard that, we said, okay, we can just put some benches into the square. But then, of course, it was like not well received as an idea because uh, as you have seen from the picture, the housing are really close to the square. <laughs> so there were a lot of flats and, and people sleeping close by and they were very scared about antisocial behavior on those benches. So we kind of agree with them and with the council to use the kind of the, the side, the the, the the farther side away from from this from the square but still a place where people would pass by and could rest it was exactly in the in the location where you see this picture uh with the two old ladies sitting there um funny enough i mean the this the brick building that you see in the back is the anish kapoor studio uh that was uh, actually quite beautiful but he didn't really want to engage uh or collaborate with us that was a very much of a shame um so I think after we installed the lighting, um, also the I mean the the council uh, realized how different can be the lighting in a space like that, and how lighting can actually improve the experience of the space in comparison to what we had before. And it's not a question of budget; it's not a question of cost. Uh, it's actually a question of thinking. Uh, thinking in a different way. Uh, these are the two residents we we start thinking about the benches and where to locate the benches and as well as part of the same experience you know lighting and seating are, are normally quite the two uh, markers for inequality in public space uh, because you you discover immediately that you know benches are are actually probably worse than lighting and in that sense you know sitting is uh, is very much seen as a, a collection for antisocial behavior so you have beautiful benches in some location like obviously the residential estates but as soon as you go to social housing it's very difficult to find benches or sitting area um and uh, and that's also i mean quite a quite a funny story about that uh after the installation of course we engage for longer period and that's where the 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 thing that we want to show you is coming from so we collect all the interviews we did uh, all the experience we did uh, i mean we had different groups we had the uh, elderly groups we had also newcomers uh, we had uh, the gardener the group the gardening club uh, so and we try to include uh, really very much everyone in the conversation uh, and i think I think, I mean, like uh, it was in a sense, it was a very simple uh, but very successful experience uh, in how you can really improve lighting uh, for bring activities in a space that was completely dead before. Um, Brandon, if you if you want to share the film, I think we are ready to go. And then after the film, we are very happy to answer all your questions. I hope that because we left quite a bit of time for question as well. Light is part of everything we do, by the light or the absence of it. And yet it's something that people really don't know a great deal about. We're configuring light. We have a research group at the London School of Economics, um, Department of Sociology and King's College, um, London. And we are unique in being a research group entirely focused on studying light and lighting in public space. We want to understand how light impacts people. We also want to improve the social knowledge base of designers and other lighting professionals um, who work with light and often um, need much deeper understanding of the places that they're intervening in. We've come to um, Brandon um, to work with Southern Council as part of their Great Estates program. It's a four-year program um, being resident-led so that residents can tell us what type of improvements they want to see on their estates. This is an estate with a very complex history. Um, so there are many kinds of connections and forms of communication. We are interested to learn about the, the kinds of people on an estate and the diversity of people that live in a place. We don't really start with light, we start with where do they live, where do they go, what do they do, and then light <coughs> just filters into that, um, that conversation really. I've lived on the estate for 34 years. I've loved every minute of living here good people, nice people, and um, we love each other. Well, that's, that's, 
more decent people than there is villains, let's put it that way. I think it can be quite an intimidating place if you don't know it. But having said that, once we started to get involved in the TRA and met lots more people, then it feels a lot friendlier. It is a real mix of people that get uh, involved in the gardening club because there's some younger people who've never done gardening before. Um, but then there's also people like Bill, who I think is in his 80s and has been gardening on this estate his entire life. So you can see that there's plenty of stuff being put in. So people are interested in using it and doing it. So it's been really nice to have an environment where those people get together because that doesn't happen very often. And what does the estate feel like at night? How does it feel walking around in the... It's evening? not too bad, actually. Well, I don't, like I say, I, I don't mind walking about, but I mean, I don't know about the girls, young girls, I don't, I don't know. I, I never feel unsafe on the estate when it's light, um, but when it gets darker, I don't know how much we're going to be out around the vegetable garden. We have had a few issues and they've been serious issues. Brandon 3 has developed a reputation for um, antisocial behaviour and other issues. I was hearing the same ambulances, police, all day. I said, then I come out, I said, what is going on? It was winter time. Yeah, yeah everywhere is dark. I went round the corner there, then I saw the boy, the boy, the boy on the floor. But unfortunately, we lost him. Oh, it was a terrible, terrible, terrible day. I have the memory in my, in my head all the time when I sleep, I remember. We had to shame the council to say not one of our council representatives had come down to see how anybody was on the estate. We hadn't had the police come down, there was no victim or councilman or support or anything, there was still blood on the yeah. on the ground. I mean the response to um, the stabbings and shooting incidents was on the residents part was to demand higher levels of lighting um, and CCTV cameras um, as well as blocking some of the paths um, so there couldn't be high-speed chases. A man from the council to whom the bench behind me is dedicated um, came to work with them um, to inspect the lighting and then put in um, some rather brutal lights <laughs> from our point of view. Um, the point though was that he cared <laughs> And everyone recognized that he cared. Putting in bright lights, whether we agree or disagree with that strategy as a lighting strategy, was a sign of care and response. The brighter, the better. Yeah. I think the brighter it is people in the past thought, the safer it will be. When you are talking about lighting in meetings and things like that, it's either if something's happened and you just want a bright light to shine in that area, or if you're trying to stop something from happening. I mean, one of the things we find when we're speaking to members of the public, when we're speaking to housing providers and councils, is they have a very limited understanding of what light is about, what, what it can do. They tend to speak um, in terms of brightness, whether the light is bright or, or dim. And on that polarity, in that they're always gonna say, we want more light, we want brighter lights without understanding that if you whack in a bright light here, you're going to have a pool of darkness here. And you have a problem when you install very bright lights of extreme contrast because our eyes can't adjust very easily. So actually, very bright lights in public space often can make a space feel less safe. There are these uh, street lighting columns uh, with three heads, not two, three heads. They're like little aliens. <laughs> And the, the, the light level that you have just around the column is really high. And then suddenly you, you end up in this kind of dark bits. The problem of bulkheads is that they don't have an optic. So, I mean, what you can see is that they just spread light in everywhere with no control. I mean, the bulkheads have been the same bulkheads in the 60s. You know, everything went on in terms of design, technology, and if you look at the bulkheads, maybe now they are LED bulkheads, but they are still the same kind of fixture that we are in the 60s. It's about the, the 
you know, the lack of care and the lack of value to what they do because they're working in a social housing state because they would never do that in another, in another residential uh, housing. They would never do that. One of the things we were able to do in Brandon with the support of the council was actually to, instru to change a space through a very simple but very effective lighting design. Sadr Council appointed us to do the lighting design for this specific square uh, because it's actually close to, to the garden uh, where the murder happened and it's also a place where people didn't feel very confident to walk through. Uh, the lighting uh, before was the usual you can find on social housing estates, so big floodlights uh, and uh, very high contrast. So they were very glary and very also white light, white color. We wanted to create uh, a much lower lighting level, uh, but with a better uniformity for people to walk through and as well to give a bit of joy to the place. Uh, we change all the lighting bulbs. Uh, they are warm LED and then we add some spotlight to the trees that are basically invisible in reality but they light very well the path. Now when the people came out as soon as the lighting was installed they say oh this is much better it's much brighter. In reality it was obviously 50% uh, less bright than before but because of uh, you know the, the festive atmosphere and as well the quality of lighting and as well the color rendering and uh, the uniformity it was perceived much brighter and much safer. I mean, the lights in Grimsel Path are beautiful now and you feel really good walking through there, it's so light. It's given us an opportunity to start reclaiming back our, our um, estate. It gives it give happiness, joy to us. Nobody can hide anywhere there. Nobody can do anything. So to have something that was much more softer and it's got more atmosphere about it, yeah, it's lovely. Whenever I go through there now, I will see people lingering and at first I'm like, why, why are they lingering? Do they live on the estate? Are they walking through? Are they up to no good? And now it's because they're just taking their time and you've got them going all different paths now. We done um, a party there a few years ago, didn't we? And it was such a shame because once it started to get a little bit dark, you felt like you had to start packing up, but it would have been so much nicer with the lights. You know, we would have been out there all night. <laughs> there have been evenings where people have been hanging out here, you know, drinking wine or, you know, playing little games until after dark, which would definitely never have happened without these lights here. And it's not that the estate was dark before, you know, there were really big street lights everywhere, but that kind of lighting doesn't make you feel safe either. The problem with social housing lighting is that it, if they just speak to function about crime reduction, it doesn't send that message of, of care. Not only does the place not feel attractive, but it does mark a place out as a problem. So aesthetics should be part of the way we think about how we care and how we show that a place is valued and cared for. I didn't know that there was other types of lighting, not other types of um, look and feel of lighting available. I think it's the understanding of what more is available out there. Um, and I think once you do a pilot on what you can actually do and see, I think other councils will actually introduce that as well. So I think that makes a big difference. Um, thank you. Uh, Don, a letter, I think that concludes the um, presentation uh, you're going to make. Um, hopefully that uh, came through clear for everyone on um, YouTube. Uh, if it didn't, um, perhaps one of you could just paste that link uh, to the video again in the um, chat um, while we're uh, talking and doing the Q&A and uh, people can obviously go and uh, have a look. Um, I, I thought it was very interesting and in, uh, the talk too. So um, uh, thank you for that. Um, thank you. We'll. Uh, I'll just take these uh, questions now as they uh, come in. So um, uh, the, the first one we've had um, 
is uh, so, so a question here uh, from, from Martin. Um, if public space lighting infrastructure oscillates between mainly homogeneous and uniformly lit spaces, um, as as a police formations and Times Square Las Vegas specularization, how do you envisage a city lighting that enables diversity? Um, but I, I think what he's getting at there is, is sort of different. You've obviously got different zones. How, how does that um, work at the interfaces? I like the social lighting utopia. Um, thank you. Yes, sorry, I'm not bit, sure yeah. what it is. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, one short answer to that is, I mean, yes, you've captured the kind of polarization that, that we're working against really well. Um, and, you know, it, it is the problem. Um, how to work through it, um, I think we're only in many ways just beginning. Um, and, you know, a first step is actually recognizing that polarization um, and, and finding other kinds of routes through it. One reason why working on a social housing estate like Brandon is so fascinating is that instead of thinking about either security or aesthetics, um, we could just talk to people and see what the, what they want to do in their spaces and work through various options. Um, it's not like there's some solution that we, as Electra said, it's because of COVID that we just presented a, a solution. Normally we wouldn't. Um, it's rather a process. How can we explore the different things that people want to do and their co conflicts and uh, the things they share and work through it together? The one thing I would just add is there have been incredible technological changes, which means that lighting can be much more adaptive, much more um, uh, able to, to respond, to be dynamic, to zone spaces in more complex ways. It's not any longer a question of just bunging in some floodlights um, that kind of flood everyone with the same light. So if you're looking for a, a utopia, part of it is technical, that we actually have so many more possibilities we can explore um, and be real shame if in this new era of control systems and LED and tunable white and all the rest of it, we weren't actually exploring those or we reserve those possibilities just for spectacular, as you say, Las Vegas style lighting. Um, as opposed to spaces we all actually live in. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, oh, sorry, Letra, are you going to come? No, in it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so so yeah, the, the next question then, uh, which is one I asked you about uh, actually when we first uh, spoke, this uh, Mark Searle saying, um, do you find that the requirements for providing resilient lighting with high IK ratings, so IK meaning um, uh, impact resistance, vandal resistance. Uh, does that limit the option of um, light selection? I mean, clearly those um, little festoon lights you put around um, aren't going to um, withstand yeah. uh, a, a rock thrown at them. Um, how do you uh, work with that? Yeah, um, I think a very, very interesting question. Yeah, of course, it's uh, completely limiting our choice uh, as well. I mean, not just IK, but as well, you know, like uh, um, emergency lighting integrated because, I mean, for some reason it can be on UPS battery. So there's a lot of the geeky part where, I mean, particularly council requires sometimes a uh, specification that, of course, they, they limit very much the range of fixture we can use. Um, and I mean, that's one of the problem I think is part of the inequality we're facing uh, because I mean, like we are we are taking for granted that if we're working on social housing state, we need to use IK10 fixture because people will destroy everything. And uh, as exactly as like, oh, we need to light up to 100 lux outside because we need to put CCTV camera because for sure they will, you know, drug dealing or kill each other or, you know, like uh, um, drink alcohol and abuse. I mean, like, uh, I mean, it's all part of the same kind of thinking and inequality that is really what we're working against, basically. Uh, and I have to say that, for example, we had um, uh, projects where, I mean, I convinced the council to go down with the IK rating uh, in Thamesmead. That is one of the most dangerous area, you know, like, oh, you think Thamesmead is like, oh, for sure they will. You know, you need like a stainless steel fixture and like, you know, undestroyable thing. And uh, we even did like a, a wall in tiles. And after six, seven years, because of course, I think we work in a, in a process, not just for the final result, not for the final image, that I think is very important to say, uh, the, the tiles are still there, perfect. 
you know, like there's no scratch, there's no uh, spray, there's nothing. They're still intact and people are very proud of them. So it's really how you work with them. Of course, if you try to impose, you know, massive bulkheads, I probably would destroy them as well, you know, like if it would, I mean, like living there. It's really, it's really a good question because it's actually is a limitation, but it's part of the problem we are, we are fighting, basically. In, in essence, if you give people nice things, they'll um, look after it. If you, if you don't, yeah. it might almost be seen as a as a challenge. And if you and if you engage them in the process, and you are, you know, you you kind of make them part of it, then of course, I, I think it's there is a way, it's a better way to do it. And then a That's good question. Really Sorry, Don. And it's, it's also what we're trying to say in the film about care and value. Um, if you treat a place as uncared for, um, it's going to become that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of it is if you treat a space purely in terms of security and securitization, that is going to be the game. Okay, And the challenge is to, to, to destroy all the security features. If instead you value it as a space that people want and like, um, you start a very different social process. And that, that's part of the job that lighting can do. Um, so we've got a, another question from Liam Minty here. Uh, so what kind of testing process did you use for your lighting proposals? What's the ideal intersection of technical parameters and human intuition? It can be difficult to gain a human perspective while designing lighting in the planning stage of new buildings. Uh, Don, you want to go with this one? Well, I mean, just very briefly, we, we don't tend to talk about testing because you don't get much funding to test anything. <laughs> um, mm. What we talk about is what well, our focus really is on research. Um, so it's a it's a research process. Um, as I say to, uh, you know, it, I don't think it's about intuition. Um, I think it's about um, understanding the diversity of people in the space that you're lighting, um, understanding the relations between those people, what they're trying to do, um, and getting and also avoiding um, formal consultations which only attract um, the voices of people who are already articulate um, so the testing as it were is going into the community and finding not just the people who are in that space but also people who are excluded from that space um, and and, th and that's a that's you know that that's a complex process it depends on how much time and money we have to do it it's also, it is a process. Um, so rather than just testing it, as you saw in the Brandon film, it's okay, you try something out, you see how people respond to it. In this case, it was a very warm response. Um, if we had more time and money, we could see how far we could push it further. So it's a learning process. Yeah, uh, so the I'm other looking. things I just want to add is, um, is regarding, you know, like a designing a planning stage for a new building. Uh, there's always uh, any out, uh, urban context that you can investigate, you know, like, uh, I mean, we work in some other, uh, in, in, you know, new new building at planning level, but you really understand the context. I mean, we organize uh, in San Rafael Estate, for example, we organize workshop with the teenager girls that were the future residents. And uh, I mean, it's something that you can definitely do also if you are at planning level. I mean, uh, that's not really a big issue, really. Uh, and then and this sort of leads on to another question uh, that, that this sort of thing about the intuitive versus uh, technical standards. Um, so to ha from uh, Thomas Dolan, I um, paraphrase here, but uh, how do you sort of square um, what you're doing with the um, with the standards, really? Um, no. You can't necessarily you, you can have a very technically uh, compliance scheme that that is a is a failure uh, on a social level as you've shown but but how do you um do, do you have to ignore those standards and uh, plow your own path no. or how, how do you reconcile no, we, that yeah we we can't ignore the standards <laughs> of course <laughs> are you working with the council i think we need to design by the standards but um i don't think that's too difficult in a sense that um a lot of time first of all we work on pedestrian space so I mean, that's kind of easier, uh, you know, to go around. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, like when uh, it's, uh, I, mean, we, I mean, sometimes, for for example, uniformity is needed, uh, minimal illuminance, even if you're in pedestrian space, uh, is um, 
it's a uh, it's still like uh, something that we kind of designed to. Uh, so it's um, I wouldn't say I mean some science standards can be unequal as well, uh, but I wouldn't say that is the lighting standards because the prejudgment of people. So they push the higher level of stance or they pick up the wrong standards for the right for the location so there's always a way to to go around it yeah i think that's interesting i think lighting standards often get blamed but um i don't know something like the new uh Sibsi code for lighting is, is probably sort of uh, uh brendan might um, correct me but it's probably about 200 pages long um and yet how many people simply dive in pick the illuminance level they need for a particular area and, and that's what they designed to um that i think that, that there's perhaps a bit more scope there i think it's really important that applying standards is never straightforward it's a choice it's about how you interpret what kind of space you're dealing with and therefore what standard applies so again going back to things like bulkheads in, so, in social housing estates the ones i talked about at the very beginning which were incredibly bright outside people's windows to the extent that they were putting black bin liners over their windows so they could sleep at night there was a choice to interpret that passageway as a public space rather than as their front door um the the you know correct me if i'm wrong Letcher, but the the kind of depending on what standard was applied the lux level could go from anywhere between about two or three up to about 110. Yes, they were okay. they were using basically standards the standards are not laws. They're in yeah, they were using what you yeah. apply. Yeah, they were using the standard for indoor corridor because in reality there's no there's no balconies mentioned in the standard. So I mean, like when you discover that and you say why you designed to 150 lux or 100 lux uh, an external balcony, and you say yeah because the only things we can find on the standard is the as corridor is the internal corridor. I mean, like there's a way to go around it to convince them that probably it's not the right choice. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of talking, of course, about standards, how to, you know, like how to read them correctly or how you interpret them. It's interesting you emphasize, also... sorry, Tom. Hmm. I was just going to say, it's interesting you emphasize that uniformity is important. So it's, it's not about um, abandoning that. But but if anything, those some of those schemes aren't thinking about what happens beyond their reference plane, um, where you suddenly drop the uh, high um, contrast level. Um, we've had a, had a question here from Louise Wicks just asking uh, about um, your work in the context of, of more sort of transit spaces, so, so bus shelters, um, cycle parking, uh, those sorts of areas. Have you, have you looked at that much or worked with um, suppliers in that market? I mean, Electra, do you want to? Okay. Yeah, I mean, like I have to say that um, sometimes we have like a, um cycle parking i have to say that we never probably work on bus i mean we work on bus stop but in a in a high street condition so it's probably quite different um and i have to say that no we we didn't i, I don't think we did work with any street furniture supplier specifically uh on how in, i mean we we tend to integrate lighting in everywhere we, we we can everywhere we we possibly can but uh i mean we work uh, on a on project by project so i don't think we tackle one manufacturer and say let's come with us and do this um as more like product design no we didn't do that and probably possible a good idea <laughs> i think um in terms of inequality issues a lot of those questions about transit spaces it's more about um, multi-user, um, you know, multi multi-function. Um, so, for example, a lot of the work with the elderly, it's a question of how do you zone spaces, um, possibly using light and color, um, to make sure that pedestrians and um, cyclists and you know different kinds of traffic can actually um, work together. Um, we also know from in many interviews that elderly people will say, if you move a light just even a few meters away from a bus shelter, it might take away my access to the city because I'd be afraid of the kind of journey to the bus stop um, and uneven uh, pav paving and so on and so forth. So these are, you know, uh, that that sense of, of how people move between different modes of transport is really crucial to multi multifunction streets. And light yeah. can help. Of course, yeah, you then have a whole, you know, 
issues of sort of motor vehicle safety and all the um, regulations for public highway light lighting as well. Um, and Brendan, thank you for uh, that at 371 pages and a nice plug there in the um, chat for anyone who wants to uh, buy the um, uh, code for lighting. Uh, and we're conscious of time here. It's been really interesting. We've got some great um, questions uh, coming in. I, I don't know if you're uh, happy to take a couple more um, and then we'll uh, sort of wrap up. Um, yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll um, just um, scrolling through uh these here i think a, well a good observation uh, from victoria uh, sadler simply saying the real issue is that um uh, a lot of the original designs aren't actually being carried out by um proper lighting uh, designers in the first place um which uh, is probably not a fair specific uh, criticism of the brand in a state or anywhere else but, but i think that that's probably um very true. You you can pick a number, you can click a calculation, you can get the number and uh, feel you've done a good job. The, um, the problem is that normally cities are designed like that. Well, <laughs> you what know? are your thoughts? Um, I'll pick up on the, the Derby uh, example out of personal interest because I've lived there for a few years. Um, that, that high street you showed, um, it, that that's a perfectly compliant scheme, isn't it? Compa if you looked at the British standards um, job done as far as the designer and the uh, council would be concerned. Yeah, it was a total disaster. Um, the other thing it was, was the result of a, I mean, this was from about 2005, I think, that street. Um, it was a public-private partnership. So Derby basically needed 30,000 light points replaced quickly. They handed it over to Balfour Beatty to um, put those in. It was designed on the back of an envelope. Um, the street lighting department had already been reduced through council cuts to two people. Um, there was, no, you know, and that locked Darby in to 30 years of those lights. Um, which Balfour Beatty, because of that kind of contract, has no incentive to ever change. Um, so it was done on the least cost possible. Yes, compliant with standards, but there are a lot of ways of being compliant without actually destroying your high street. Um, and as you could see from that contrast of two pictures, the treatment for that, I've got to say, it, working class commercial high street, was a million miles away from the way in which the middle class dining and tourist area was lit, um, equally compliant. And that's why I always use those images. I mean, they speak volumes to inequalities. Um, the compliance, I've just got to add, was also based on, you know, basically, again, prison yard lighting, that the responsibility of the council was not to make a nice, cared for, valued place for people to enjoy but one which matched the standards, which without much evidence are meant to reduce crime and antisocial behavior. Of course it doesn't. It was um, a, a complete disaster, complete yeah, disaster. Um, yes, no, I'm sort of playing devil's advocate, but yeah, but yeah very yeah. well um, said. Um, James Poor uh, is uh, one of our um, SLL uh, members and uh, I, I know he's done um, a bit of work on this uh, himself actually uh, and looked at it in the past. Um, he he paraphrases his question, but really is it is it sort of simply about um, kind of lower light levels, warmer colour temperatures, calmer environment, um, getting back to a sort of some subconscious craving for um, kind of the, the the campfire I suppose uh is it as simple as that or is there, there more to it than just um putting in warmer uh lamps I I'm I I understand where that's coming from but it always worries me to appeal to a kind of historical unconscious um partly because we've done a lot of work in different many different cultures Latin America India um, Australia, Thailand recently, Electra, um, and the meanings of color and light colors and color temperatures mm -hmm. is unbelievably various. It also depends on things like age and the way you actually detect different color changes. Um, 
what I totally agree with is that we need to use lighting in sensitive ways that relate to everyone's really complete sensory experience and memory. So, you know, things like fire, associations with hearth and home and so on, absolutely crucial, but it's not simple. Okay, it's actually really, really complex, and it's very, very different across cultures and histories. Um, I'd also say that, you know, just as certain kinds of warm temperatures make us feel warm and cozy, there are times where you actually want cold blue light um, for different kinds of effects. So again, it always comes back to those questions of what are different kinds of people trying to do in this space? And how are we going to use the different properties of light to actually help them and support them? Yeah, depending on the context. I, I, I love warm colors. You know, that's my thing as well. You know, but then I come from a certain culture and class mm. and all the rest of it. Sorry, I left her. Yeah, no, I'm just saying that is also very North European kind of style, you know, like there is a there is an association to warmer colors to, you know, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Norway and UK is part of it. But as soon as you move farther south, I mean, like I'm Italian, I mean, warmer colors, particularly in south of Italy, are not that well seen uh, also in public space. So it is actually one of the things that we want to try next year with the, the Enlighten Me project is actually you know, how people perceive in different at different latitude the, the color light. And for example, in, in Estonia, that is uh, snowy and, you know, like for six months a year, I mean, warmer color not well seen because it's not that crispy when it's snowing. So, I mean, like, it's not, it's not just that. In certain contexts, it, it can work. But of course, I mean, I think you need to understand really very much the context to, to take a decision. So it's not always the same. I'll give you one really difficult situation in Amsterdam. Um, as I said, there are large Very ethnic difficult. minorities, particularly Turkey, Turkish and Moroccan. The Dutch, very close to Denmark, um, have a kind of huga type love of warm light. Um, within Muslim culture, um, bright green light is the sign of hospitality. How do you make a street? OK, which is going to be warm and inviting to people who like both fluorescent green um, and other people who like warm orange glow and fire like glows. That's the question that's, you know, but that is dealing with inequality and the right of everyone to of access to to public space. Well, I'll pose a final question then before we wrap up, which is, um, I mean, this has been really, really interesting. I hope uh, really thought provoking for um, everybody who's joined us. Uh, we still have um, almost 90 people uh, listening in, which um, given we're uh, running over is, uh, is a real credit and we had over a, a hundred um, for the main event. Um, so we could certainly talk uh, for a lot longer. I guess the, the closing thoughts then from you, um, we've got a lot of lighting designers and people from the SLL uh, and others listening in, people from local uh, authorities. Um, what, 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 what can we all do about it? How can we sort of move this out of the academic realm of interesting and very detailed research pilot projects, but actually take this a bit more mainstream now um, and, and sort of use it as a industry. <laughs> well, I mean, like, I mean, we, we do it, you know, like, uh, you know, that I also have my my lighting office and we, we work in that sense. I mean, we mix very mm. much uh, the academic experience and the academic background with the real life that, of course, I mean, it's tough, it's not easy, it's not always successful, um, but it's a way to go. I mean, like, I think the main point, and I think something that I really stress every time with, uh, you know, I mean, I have a lot of friends that are lighting designer, of course, is like, try to work not on paper, you know, like try to at least see the place that you're working for, that you are design, um, you know, try to understand who is living there, which are the, I mean, hierarchy of paths and lighting strategies, they all come out, you know, sometimes, I mean, I work in a lot of different offices, you know, they come out from computers and CAD plan and but in reality you know how people are walking which which is the main path sometimes is not the largest you know <laughs> not plan but it's actually a path that people are using because it's easier to get to and how people are changing their their way of walking through a place if it's by day and by night and that's it's it's very mixed with the gender and gender equality as well so I mean we are talking a lot of issues that are 
I mean, first, very fashionable, I would say so. I mean, people should be interested in developing them. But as well, they're very, very contemporary. And uh, I mean, we work a lot with, uh, we we make space for girls as well. And they have the kind of similar approach. I mean, there's different offices now that uh, they're, they're bringing the, these to real life level, let's say. It's not pure ac academy, you know, like it's, uh, there. there's a way to go where you can, of course, I mean, it's probably more time consuming, uh, less money making, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it's definitely more interesting in terms of how we can uh, preserve i mean our cities and the way we we can create better environments considering that the planet is going really down <laughs> that's my depressive view <laughs> to close the talk <laughs> no but there's a way to go i think there's a there's option and uh, i'm quite optimistic about the fact that is uh, i mean compared to 10 years ago where it seems we were like really pioneering this i mean now it's uh, it's really something that people are talking about there are like a lot of people interested and you know taking care uh, the same the, the fact that we are here talking about it i think is really really good sign uh, so i'm sure that we are moving in the right direction in that sense I think it's important to be positive like that. Again, when we started configuring light, people thought we were crazy even talking about this stuff, whereas now it's kind of, you know, you could have a good conversation like this, um, which is a wonderful sense of change. Um, just to add to what the lecture was saying, I mean, it, it, I, just two things. One is totally agreeing. It's about get out of the studio, get out of the office, get away from the monitor and actually go out and observe. But what you have to add on to that, and, and this is what I like to say to not just lighting designers, but urban designers generally, don't be afraid of complexity. That's where it's at. You have to actually, even though complexity makes your life less efficient, probably more costly, um, you know, your client gets upset if you raise issues, um, but that's the only way to do the, the, our jobs properly. Um, is to actually recognize if you're intervening in a social world, it's a complex thing. And you have to really make as much effort within your time and money resources as possible to understand the complexity of the world that you're actually redesigning. Um, so yeah, learn how to observe, learn how to observe honestly and openly, and uh, to uh, as far as you can, uh, you know, embracing the diversity of the people you're dealing with. Uh, Don, Electra, thank you very much. Um, it's been really, really interesting. Thank um, thank you to everyone who uh, joined us. Um, and I, I won't apologise for running on because um, I think think we could have uh, carried on going actually, but um, very thought provoking, and uh, I hope it does um, certainly lead to some some fresh uh, approaches in, in in our industry and um, getting out there and um, talking to people a bit more, um, not not sort of assuming what um, communities might want. Um, just before we uh, close, I'll just mention our next uh, upcoming event. So uh, on Friday, the 21st of April, um, this is going to be quite a different one with a, um, an in-person event uh, with a look at TM66 and the circular economy. Uh, we're going to be looking at some practical case studies of how light fittings can be re-engineered and uh, reused. Um, that's going to be hosted up at Coco Lighting's manufacturing uh, facility in Braintree in Essex, uh, run jointly with the Home Counties Northeast region. Uh, do uh, keep a look out for emails on that one and um, we'll hope to uh, see you there. Um, those of you who'd like a CPD certificate, if you email through to sll at sipsy.com, um, that will be uh, sent through. And uh, as I said, you should get a um, link or look out on the SLL uh, website for the um, uh, recording of this event. And uh, I guess the slides will be um, hosted there as well. So uh, that, that's it, really. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, have a good rest of the afternoon. And um, uh, well, Don, the lecturer, hope to um, see you again soon. Yeah. Thank Bye. you very much very for much. hosting us. Uh, thank yeah, you, Chris. Pleasure. Thank you, Brendan. And thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks.